Hey everyone, Faya here. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to make a great ward loop character very cheap. Before we get into the video, I'm going to run you through a few very important disclaimers so that you're not left disappointed. And our first disclaimer is that the term budget is being used relatively. Now to some of you guys, 20x may be a lot of money, but compared to the 1 mirror plus ward loop characters out there, 20x is very cheap. Second disclaimer is that Wardloop isn't very tanky. A lot of people like to use the phrase that Wardloop is deceptively tanky, and to be honest, I think those people are lying. Now, you may look at Wardloop tanking hits, and it takes absolutely no damage, and you think that, wow, that build is invincible. It's anything but. Any damage that isn't fatal just doesn't manage to pass the threshold of being able to damage you through the ward. Any big hits, well, they get right through, and because you don't have a lot of HP and mana to begin with, you kind of die instantly. Now this is absolutely fine, because after a bit of playing around with this build, you're going to very quickly become aware of what hits can kill you and what hits can't kill you, and you'll just avoid the things that do kill you. Disclaimer number three, you are not going to get very good use out of your Sentinels. Now, it is technically possible to do so, it just requires a lot of effort, and since you're playing a build where the damage is automated, that tells me that you're playing this build because you kinda just wanna be watching Netflix while grinding out currency, and if that's the case, you're not willing to put in all that effort to get value out of your Sentinels, otherwise you just would've been playing a different build. Number four, we can't use the Wrath of the Cosmos keystone. So on the Atlas passive tree, the most powerful keystone in my opinion is Wrath of the Cosmos. It's the one that massively increases the amount of Eldritch currency you get in return for taking lots of extra damage when you activate the altars. And the problem with this is that it causes your self damage to start bypassing your ward threshold and you just end up dying. Don't make the same mistake I did where I played this build for three days with Wrath of the Cosmos allocated just thinking that, hey, this build is goddamn terrible and everything kills you. This build is complicated, and not just even a little complicated. This makes min-maxing cast on crit look like child's play. Now, I have provided some very highly detailed resources that will practically hold your hand through this content. But let's be real, a bunch of you are still gonna fuck it up anyway, so maybe you want to think twice about whether this is the build for you. Now before we have a look at the gear, I'm going to do a brief mechanics overview. If you don't care about this stuff, or you just trust my POBs and know that I'm going to get it right, you can feel free to skip past this entirely, just click on the next chapter of the video. So first off, the most important part of this build is maintaining 100% uptime on your Old Wrath's Resolve. Now this is a flask, and this is the flask that makes your ward permanent, with the penalty of making your ward weaker, or lowering the ward value that your character has. This is achieved by stacking up a whole bunch of different multipliers. To begin with, we're going to be getting a lot of reduced charges used, you're going to get 10-20% to from your belt, and you're also going to reduce the increased charges used rolled on your flask. This is very important, and this really determines how many medium cluster points you have to uh, end up using. If you get the best roll on the flask and you get at least 18% reduced charges used on your belt, you are able to save four points on the tree. In addition to that, you're going to be looking for 64 to 88% increased flask duration. So you're going to get 40% from having four distilled perfection cluster notables. You're going to be getting 24 or 48% from your minor nodes on medium clusters. These are the four points I was talking about. If you manage to get good rolls on your flask and your belt, you can only run four of these. Otherwise, you have to run eight. And the other increased flask duration you're going to be getting is base duration, and that's obtained from getting a 28% quality roll on your flask via Hillock. Now, the thing that lets us keep our flask up forever is the fact that we're gaining charges passively. This means you don't have to rely on killing any monsters or anything. You can just keep it up forever, even in your hideout. You gain three every three seconds via your ascendancy, which is why we're playing a scion. You gain one every three seconds from the flask mastery and four every five seconds from your timeless jewel. It's very important to note that where a lot of the online Ulroth calculators go wrong is that they are assuming that you're gaining a consistent amount of flask charges every second. The way it works in game is that the game just has an internal timer that ticks on its own. So every three seconds in game, you gain those three flask charges. You gain the one flask charge and every five seconds you gain four. And it's not based on when you use the flask, it's just its own internal timer. And this is why a lot of these calculators can sometimes tell you that you have 100% uptime, but then you go in game and you, it turns out you fall just short. Fortunately, as of recently, POB now accurately calculates this. It takes into account these timers and assumes a worst case scenario in order to determine whether you have 100% uptime or not. And my own calculator does the same. It's a little more detailed in case you want to fiddle around with things and you don't know how to input them into POB. 
Finally, we're going to be gaining 125% increased charges gained. You're going to, going to be gaining 10% from a Balbella notable, 80% from the fasting cluster notables, and 35% from taking essence extraction on the tree, which is how you're going to also obtain your flask mastery. An important thing to note is that this stat only matters in multiples of 25%. So don't don't spend a lot of money trying to get a second or a third Balbala notable because if you do not reach 150% increased charges gained, you're not getting any benefit. Now, the reason for this is because if you look at the amount of flask you're gaining, uh, the flask charges you're gaining every three seconds, you're gaining four every three seconds. And from the timeless jewel, you're gaining four every five seconds. To increase four up to five requires 25%. And that's why 25% multiples are the only numbers that matter. It's for this same reason that the duration doesn't scale linearly as well. The duration only matters when you reach multiples of three or five. So it does matter to get nine seconds and 10 seconds, but going from 10 to 11 seconds makes absolutely no difference. However, when you do reach 12 seconds, Seconds, you get an extra lot of four or rather nine charges from your ascendancy and the flask mastery. Now the next important part of this process is making sure that you get your summon skeletons down to 0.198 seconds. This may seem like a random number but it's anything but. It's actually exactly six server ticks. In fact we're going to get to a number that rounds to this. We achieve this by on the high budget POB obtaining 51% less duration via the less duration support at level three and with 20 quality. We're going to be running 58% reduced duration via three two dust jewels and then we're going to get an additional 40 percent reduced duration via the anomalous minion speed gem. On the even lower budget POB, we achieve this a different way. We use swift affliction support rather than uh, anomalous minion speed, and then we also obtain a fourth to dust jewel as well as the less and reduced duration cluster in mastery. Finally, to make sure that the loop works and that we're getting five casts of each spell per second, we need to sync up our cast when damage taken cooldown with the skeleton duration at 0.198 seconds or six server ticks. We have achieved this by obtaining 27% CDR, and the best way to do this is to get 20% CDR via our Shaper Belt, then we can either get 7% from our Eater of Worlds Implicit on our boots, or 5% from our boots and 2% from an Abyss Jewel. Now the best and fastest way to level this character up is using my Twink Guide. I'm going to link to this and all of the other resources that you need in the description below the video. Once you have reached level 67, you need to make sure that you have done the first three lives, and then you can respect your character to take as many life nodes as possible, equip a bunch of life gear as well as flasks that have defenses on them so that you're also chaos res capped and have armor innovation, and then you're going to go buy yourself a five-way carry. Now you don't have to buy a five-way carry, you can get a friend to run you through Breach Stones and Coward's Trial, but the five-way carry will only set you back three to four exalts and it is the fastest way to get to around the mid to high level 80s which is when you can then go to the next step of this build once you finish up with your five-way carries you want to pick one of the pobs labeled functional doesn't really matter which there's about five to six exalts worth of difference between the two between the high budget and the low budget and you're going to set your tree up something like this now because we didn't get fully ascended before we did this entire process we are left unable to start at the witch area so we have to use these nodes here to hook up our ascendant uh, part of the tree to the witch part of the tree. This isn't really a problem. And as you can see here, this build is coming online at level 75. There's no way you're going to be level 75 when you're done with your five-way carries unless you died like three of the five runs. So this should not be a problem at all. You're just going to set your tree up like this, and then you're going to go do a few maps to get some, um, get some extra levels and some experience. You want to get attuned to the idea of playing ward loop. It's a little uncomfortable at first, I'm not going to lie. So just go practice in maps until you're comfortable, and then go get your uh, Uber Ascended, and then after you're Uber Ascended and after you have a few more levels, you can move up to the next level of the POB, and these are the POBs labeled Primary. So what's actually happening with this POB? Well, basically you're going to start off here in the middle and you're gonna just take these two, two jewel nodes as quickly as possible. You're gonna come down here, take the resistance nodes and then this third jewel uh, slot over here. You're gonna come over here and take the life and the mana stuff. It's very important to pick up the mana mastery for damage taken recouped as mana. This allows us to sustain our obscene mana cost. We have truly obscene mana cost. And if you don't take this node, there's literally no way you can possibly sustain your mana costs. Finally, you're gonna be taking the trader over here. This is very important. Then this comes from our timeless tool. So if you if you see that I take out the brutal restraint, this turns into iron grip. You really need this, and then you also really need one of your other notables to also say 10% increased flask charges gained. You're probably gonna to have to divine this quite a few times until you hit what you need, but that's totally okay. So then you're gonna come up here and you're going to start from the witch tree. You're going to take the mana and the life stuff over here. You're going to take the crit stuff over here. You're going to come across here and take the flask stuff over here, including the flask mastery, where your utility flasks are gaining one charge every three seconds. This is super important. As you can see, my flasks are always up, and that's 
you know, thanks to all the flask investment that we're picking up. You're going to take this jewel socket over here. You're going to take mind over matter. These life nodes here are kind of optional. You, you take them when you have higher amount, uh, a higher amount of points, basically. You can take these strength or dex nodes to fix up your attribute requirements, but you sort of take this as needed. These are totally unnecessary if you don't end up needing them, of course. You want to take serpent stance because these are just great crit nodes. And on top of that, you're getting access to the staff mastery. 30% increase defenses while wielding a staff. Ward is a type of defense. So this is really good for us. Now after here, you come across here, you take the life stuff, you take the mana stuff, you take damage taken recouped as life. Now, life recoup is just as good as mana recoup. It's an insane amount of regeneration. It pretty much makes us immune to all forms of degen in the game, with a couple of exceptions, and it allows us to permanently sustain Righteous Fire, which is a very, very large increase to our DPS. This alone is allowing us to get 40% more DPS just from having Perma Righteous Fire. You take the Jewel Slot over here, you take the Cold nodes over here, including the Cold Mastery, 25% chance to gain a Frenzy Charge when you shatter an enemy. This is mostly to sustain your phase run, not actually for the damage. Damage. but we'll talk about that a little more later on and then other than that you're just taking the cluster jewels now we're not doing anything fancy with our cluster jewels we're just taking one notable that's going to position prismatic heart in a way that we can pick it up while we're bathing to the jewel sockets now prismatic heart is super important because this build is running this stuff and this stuff massively reduces the amount of elemental resistances that we're picking up and so it's really important to get resistance wherever you can now, other than that, you're just going to be taking the medium cluster jewels that I recommend um, in other parts of the guide, where we're taking distilled perfection and fasting. Now, you want to buy all of these as five passives, pretty much because you might need the a, a second lot of these smalls. Now, in this case, I have some six sockets. I have to swap out of those. These are kind of a remnant of when I, from when I was playing the build in an earlier iteration and still testing stuff out. These two nodes here that I have are totally unnecessary with the way my build is currently set up. But you can sort of see that, yeah, I'm losing two points by doing this. You might need them, however, right? Yeah. You're gonna have to consult the calculator and consult all of my other resources because you might need these extra nodes. But I would recommend getting the five passive ones so that when you're ready to spec out of them, you can. You don't have to go buying new items entirely. And that's pretty much just all that's happening with the POB. As for the gear, I'm going to start by talking about the ward items first. Now, the ward items you want, the gloves to have around 400 ward. You want the boots to either have 400 ward or 350 ward, depending on whether you're picking up a movement speed prefix. This is totally up to you. I've played it with and without the movement speed. I prefer the movement speed personally, but feel free to just grab the extra ward if you feel you really need it. I don't think you do because you can... I don't think 50 ward is worth giving up movement speed for, but I've seen some people that are really insistent that it's important to do so. And then as for your helmet, you want 600 ward. Now, crafting these items yourself is probably going to take four exalts per item. I wouldn't really recommend it since you can pick up what we're looking for much cheaper. What you want to do basically is just go pick up any ward item that has a bunch of resistances as suffixes. Since we're not playing omniscience and you don't need the attributes, these items tend to be quite a bit cheaper because people assume that obviously the attribute stuff has to be more expensive since the omni people own more money and the people who don't own omni can't afford more expensive gear. And they're kind of right about that, which is why we're doing that. So if you have to craft them, I have crafting guides that will talk you through the process, but I really recommend not to use them because all my trade links link to items that will fulfill the, cri the criteria for just purchasing these items outright. And purchasing these items usually costs you one to two exalts rather than the four you're going to spend crafting them. This build runs a bunch of very important uniques and you can't really swap them out, so let's talk about them. The Annihilating Light Staff is just one of the best weapons in the entire game. They triple your damage and most other weapons can't even come close to this, but it does have a very hefty penalty. Fortunately, we've put the build together in a way that the penalty doesn't really affect us all that much. So this is going to house your utility link, mainly because your skin of lords is giving you extra gem levels. Because this is a utility setup, you do not need it to be six link. All you need is the 60% reduced elemental resistances roll. So just buy one of these with the correct roll and then five link it yourself. It's very cheap to five link it yourself at the crafting bench. You don't need the six link. Six linking, six linking this only really gives you access to the onslaught support gem. And if you have the onslaught support gem, then you can anoint counterweight. If you don't have a six link, you have to anoint graceful assault to get count, uh, to get onslaught from your anoint instead. Graceful assault's going to give you onslaught on kill. You don't have to even do that. You can just run counterweight and drop the onslaught. But I personally prefer having the extra movement speed since I value movement speed. And this is supposed to be a mapping build in my opinion. I don't value it very much as a blight farmer. Totally up to you. And it's all covered in all of my other resources. So you can make this decision for yourself. Okay, moving on. 
we need heartbound loops and you want to put not just catalysts on these heartbound loops to get them to 20% so that you take 420 physical damage on minion death. Now, this is kind of the core part of the build where we're going to summon minions, the minions die, we take damage, the damage doesn't actually damage us through our ward, but it does deal damage as far as cast from damage taken gems are concerned. That triggers Forbidden Right, which deals even more damage. This triggers our main spell gem, uh, skill links, but the damage taken also triggers more skeletons, which die, which perpetuates the loop. Next up is the Skin of the Lords. Now, this is a bit of a complicated item, but kind of also not really. This has two very important things on it. It's got increase, 100% increased global defenses. This massively buffs our ward. So as you can see, if I take this off, my ward drops right down. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep this. It also gives us plus two to level of socketed gems. This allows us to get really good value out of our empower support. And also it's giving a, giving us a lot of extra value out of cast one damage taken support. Now cast one damage taken support actually has really strong gem level scaling once you start to get it to a higher level. Although it does kind of become hard to meet the damage requirements, but the way we've got it set up is that it perfectly benefits from being in the skin of the lords. You're going to get, you're going to get tons of mileage out of having it in the skin of the lords. It's just adding so much damage to our main setup. But there is one big, or two big downsides really. First off, we can't modify the sockets. So you're going to have to get two red, two blue, two green. And on top of all this, the keystone that it comes with, because it comes with a free keystone, it may break your build. All of the trade links in my forum guide and in my shopping list in the spreadsheet, they filter out the perfect skin of Lords for you. It gets rid of all the junk, all of the bad keystones, the gem combinations that you don't need. All you need to do is follow these trade links and it will allow you to buy any skin of the lords that pops up on that filter so you don't have to use your brains. Next up on the list is the Pandemonious Amulet. We're not running Omniscience, but this is kind of the next best thing as far as this build is concerned. Obviously, much weaker than Omniscience, but it's still ticking enough boxes to sort of be our best in slot and it beats out a lot of the alternatives that you can obtain at a similar level of budget. So we're just going to run this and we're going to run either the counterweight or graceful assault anoints on it as i mentioned previously the last two uniques that we need to worry about on our character are the old Roth's resolve flask i've talked a bit about this already the only thing that really the only two things that really matter on this item are the increased charges per use roll and the quality you want it at 28 quality and you really want it to be at 40 percent increased charges per use fortunately when you divine it this is the only roll that matters so on average, 10 Divines, you get a perfectly rolled one, and getting Hillock for 28% uh, Flask quality is probably going to cost you one Exalt, but it's fine because you can buy these already at 28% quality a lot cheaper than that. The last unique item in this build is the Dying Sun Flask. Now, normally this has two additional projectiles, but for us, it's only giving us one additional projectile, and that's because of the Survival Secrets jewel that we're running uh, in order to lessen the penalty from Ulroth's Resolve. A consequence of lessening that penalty is also lessening the benefit from Dying Sun, but it's still pretty good. One additional projectile still means we're getting, you know, extra damage on both our Creeping Frost and on our Ice Spear, and it also means that Freezing Pulse has slightly better coverage, so we kind of can't afford not to take this. We run nine unique jewels in this build, and it's really important to talk about them, I think. So we're going to talk about the only jewel that you can really cut from this build if you don't have the jewel sockets or you want to put something else in, and that is Clear Mind. Clear Mind is not doing anything necessary, really. It's something that you can just remove, and you lose the bonuses on that gem and nothing else. And those bonuses are pretty much just 60% increased spell damage while no mana is reserved. The increased mana regeneration here does not matter one single bit, so don't worry about it at all. So. With that out of the way, what's left? Okay, so see, Survival Secrets is a very important jewel in our build. It's giving you 20% reduced effective flask. Now, you might be thinking that that's bad, but as I mentioned before, it's lessening the penalty of Ulroth's Resolve. So as you can see, Ulroth's Resolve is going to be reducing our ward by 70%, but thanks to Survival Secrets, we can actually mitigate the impact that that has. So as you can see here, I have 3.1k ward. Now, when I turn Ulroth's on, that reduces down to 1,000 ward. And if I open my tree and I suck it in Survival Secrets, that should have gone up. Okay, hold on. On the, on the next one, it'll go up. Yeah, there, there you go. So now that it's got used again, 1.5k ward. So this is giving us like 50% extra ward, if you think about it, just by having Survival Secrets socketed in our gear. Brew Restraint, I've talked about this already while we're going through the POV. You need it to save Balbala, and you need it to also give you 10% increased Flask Charges gained. So be ready to spend a lot of Divines trying to hit this one. Not much else to say here. Now, our two Dust Jewels, we need to get two that say 19% reduced skeleton duration and one that says 20% reduced skeleton duration. If you're using the low budget one, the one that's like six exalts cheaper than the high budget one, we're going to be running four of these jewels and they each have to have 18% reduced skeleton duration. It's going to be slightly cheaper for you, but you have to spend extra points on the tree to bridge the rest of that reduced skeleton duration. So 
All right, doesn't really matter. There's nothing else going on here. And you can pretty much ignore all of the other rolls on these jewels. Finally, the Grand Spectrums. Okay, so you're probably not gonna get them with the corruptions that I have, but basically the thing that's really good about the Grand Spectrums is that for a start, this build is really starved with, uh, when it comes to increased damage, and each of these jewels is giving us 45% increased elemental damage, as well as being cheap enough that when you're ready to buy upgrades, you can get them with pretty useful corrupts. So if you really wanna get immune to corrupted blood, just to be extra safe on the degen, you can get that. You can get immune to uh, silence, maim, a whole bunch of stuff. You can, yeah, but you can also get the damage corrupts and the damage corrupts are a reasonably cheap way to get a really large amount of damage out of a jewel. The extra benefit to this is that you can sub one, two, or even just all three of these out for the Crimson Grand Spectrums, which are going to give you 21% all res each. So the reason why this is really good is because we're resist starved already from Annihilating Light. And if you have to go extra budget on your ward items because you can't afford to get them with good ward and good resist, well, that's where Grand Spectrum comes in. You just get 21% all res from each Grand Spectrum. And uh, yeah, that makes it a lot easier to hit your cap. You can use all three if you want. It's totally up to you. Now, this gem guide is found in the spreadsheet. You're going to want to consult that. It's got a lot of details in it. And the, the spreadsheet just in general is very useful. Now, your cost one damage taken gem in your Skin of the Lords, that has to be a level 19 or a level 20, but it's important to know which one you're taking and why. If you have 2,235 maximum life or more, you're taking a level 20 gem because you can afford to. If you don't have this amount of life, your Forbidden Right gem will not deal enough damage to you to trigger level 20 cost one damage taken. Therefore, if you don't have enough maximum life, you need to take a level 19. Your Ice Fear and your Creeping Frost can both be level 21. These are your main sources of damage, so they obviously should be as high a level as possible. You can run a level 3 Empower or a level 4 Empower. This one's up to you. If you really want to spend the extra money on the level 4 Empower, you can, but I think there are better ways to spend money uh, in the short term, but I'm going to leave this one up to you. Then you want to round these links out with level 20 Cold Pen and level 20 Greater Multiple Projectiles. Now, GMP is really good in this because Creeping Frost and Ice Fear both shotgun with their projectiles, but on top of all that, Creeping Frost at a distance spreads its projectiles out. This is why if you saw in the clips at the start of this video, I can just run right through a map and everything around me dies because of freezing, uh, the Creeping Frost is spreading its projectiles out and hitting absolutely everything. And honestly, I love this. Okay, in the Staff Links, you can have a level 20 or 21 cast on damage taken and freezing pulse. It's important to know if you're using a level 21 freezing pulse, you need to use a level 21 cast on damage taken. I recommend just getting the level 20s if money is a problem for you, pretty much because this isn't your main damage link. The amount of damage freezing pulse does is kind of minimal. I know some people are really into min maxing and saying like the extra level matters. It, it really doesn't. Like, <laughs> it doesn't. Just take my word for it. This is purely a utility link. We're getting Bone Chill, which is kind of like a cold version of Shock. We're getting Arcane Surge, which is 20% more DPS. We're getting Culling Strike, which is 11% more DPS. And finally, we're building Onslaught uh, into our character. This doesn't give us any extra damage, but it is the optional sixth link, and it gives you 20% extra movement speed, which is a very useful part of increasing your clear speed. It's not damage, but it may as well be damage because it's functioning very similarly to it. So, yeah. Okay, now in our skeleton links, if you're using the low budget version of the build, you want to go for these, uh, this one over here where you're taking level 20 tw and 20 quality less duration in addition to a level 1 swift affliction. Otherwise, you're using a level 3 less duration with 20 quality and then you're using a level 1 minimum anomalous minion speed with 20 quality. And then you're going to combine those with a level 5 cast one damage taken and a level 11 anomalous summon skeleton support. That Anomalous Summon Skeleton support has to be at least 2 quality to guarantee that your skeletons remain undamageable while they are alive. Lastly, we have the Forbidden Right links. So this is just going to be a 3 link with a level 16 cast when damage taken support, level 1 Forbidden Right gem, and then a level 18 Sniper's Mark that has 20% quality. This kind of gives us the maximum amount of damage from Sniper's Mark while still being able to trigger the Forbidden Right from the amount of damage that you're getting from only sacrificing 3 rather than 4 skeletons at a time. And then you're going to have an unlinked 4th gem, or I guess you can technically link it, the point is it doesn't really matter, and that's going to be a level 20 Val Righteous Fire. Now you're going to have the Righteous Fire turned on permanently, but you can turn on the Val Righteous Fire for additional damage at bosses. And then after all this, you have a 4 link utility setup where you're running Eternal Blessing with Purity of Elements, both at level 20 and both linked and this allows us to, to just have a free aura at all times and then unlinked or rather you can have a link have them linked and like the Val Righteous Fire doesn't really matter is going to be Flame Dash and Phase Run. Now some people like just having the Phase Run on its own. 
I wouldn't really recommend that because there are times you need to cross terrain, uh, terrain and it's much more efficient to just use a flame dash rather than walking around. Now the phase run needs to be level 17 and I re really recommend 20% quality because it scales really well with quality. You can level it up further depending on your attribute requirements and stuff like that, but 17 is pretty safe. I did just want to spend a minute talking about the resources I put together for this guide. This video may not be the most in-depth in terms of everything. I've kind of raced through all the details and I'm just explaining what's on the screen, but a lot of the details are in all of the resources I put together. So I have an Ulroth uptime calculator in case you just want to be extra sure because it's something you don't, you're not comfortable inputting into POB or for whatever reason, really, you can just use this calculator. There are the ward loop requirements, which are pretty much just all the gems at all the levels and all of the qualities that you need to mimic. And then a little thing that explains what you need for the cooldown recovery. There's ward loop troubleshooting, which sort of runs you through a few of the steps that might explain why your, why your ward loop is not working. There's a shopping list. Now, like with all my shopping lists, you can pretty much just highlight an entire column of uh, links and then you can right click, go view more cell actions and open links. And this is going to open all of the trade links that you need to buy for your build all at once. Okay, that's probably very excessive and PoE is going to lock you out of looking anything up. But it's still probably the best way to do it. Maybe do it half and half, kind of up to you. Uh, it will take a while to get through this list anyway, so maybe do it half at a time. Yep, that's fine. Um, there are crafting guides. Now these aren't terribly detailed crafting guides, but that's because the crafting projects aren't very detailed anyway they're very basic and pretty much just involve dense fossil spam and <laughs> then cleaning the suffixes and multi-modding them on it's very low effort and then you have a recombinator guide for your belt okay finally you have a skin of the lord's tier list this is not necessary at all but i just felt i would put this resource together and explain it to everyone who was wondering about like if they really wanted to get the most out of the skin of the lords what they're looking for and why they're looking for it and this just tells you all of the keystones that will brick your build, all of the keystones that are pretty much neutral for your build and don't really matter, the keystones that will save you one extra point on the tree, and then the keystones that are... Well, Unwavering Stance is just really good for your build because if you get Unwavering Stance, then, well, it's GG because you don't have other ways of immuning stone. In addition to the spreadsheet resource, there's also a written guide, which I've just finished writing and uploading today. It's got a ton of detail as well. There's probably stuff in here that if the, it's not contained in the spreadsheet or in this video, you can probably find it here. So give this a look if there's anything you're unsure about. It's also got some details to get in contact with me if you're having any troubles with the build and you really feel that you would prefer I answer a question. Before we wrap up, I need to give a big shout out to the British Exile. I thought Ward Loop was a total meme build and I had no interest in it until I saw him playing it and he was absolutely fucking shit up. Fast forward a few days, I was having an absolute blast with it. Such a blast that even though I don't like doing build guides anymore, I absolutely had to make a guide for this build. And hey, while we're at it, I'd also like to give credit to the 69 people whose POE ninja profiles I blatantly ripped off. So when I decided I was going to make this character, I sat down, I opened up a new Chrome window, and I just clicked all of the POE ninja profiles on the first page. And then I clicked a bunch of different criteria and clicked on all of the character profiles for those people. And I just kept doing this until I had like literally close to 70 different profiles open and then I just went to town and I started copying all of the good ideas out of all of them until I made an amalgamation of all these good ideas. I then added some of my own tech and some of my own optimizations and that's the guide that you have in front of you today. So good job guys, I don't know who you are but you deserve a lot of credit for a lot of the hard work that you put in. Remember if you like this video please give me a like, comment and subscribe, I would really appreciate it and hopefully I will see you guys soon.